Can we uh, start the second session? I'd like to welcome you all back. I think with the windows open, we can now breathe again, which is always an advantage in a seminar. With the second panel, uh, again, an all-female panel, which I think is great, two all-female panels. It's nice, uh, I think, to, to very happy that has happened. We have three excellent speakers, uh, and, but in this panel we're going to focus particularly on socio-demographic dynamics of Euro-Mediterranean relations, so a, a change in focus from the political and security perspective, uh, but I think very welcome and important. So we have with us uh, Daniela Huber, who is scientific coordinator of the Med Reset project here at, the, uh, at YAI. Uh, Paolo Termine, who is uh, Rural Youth and Migration Office uh, uh, from the Euro Rural Youth and Migration Office of the sub, sub regional office for North Africa at the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. And also Anna Di Bartolomeo, who is uh, a senior research fellow at the University of Venice Cafoscari, and also until very recently a member of staff at the Migration Policy Center at the European University. Institute. So again, the same format, around 10 minutes or so for presentations and, and, and conversation between the panelists, as we saw in the first session, and then we'll have some time for discussion. Thank you. So. Thank you very much. Um, I very much enjoyed the first panel, so I hope the second one will be interesting too. Uh, the research that I'm presenting today is actually related to another FP7 project which is uh, ending right now, which we have coordinated here at YAI on youth in the Mediterranean region. And um, I will present my research here on EU and, and US um, policies in, in two uh, countries, Morocco and Tunisia. But I will also present uh, research on uh, youth policies of Morocco and Tunisia that has not been pursued by me, but by the coordinators of the project. So actually, here the credit shouldn't be given to me. Um, now, um, my research very much focused on actually a discourse analysis of how the EU speaks about youth in these countries, which I will not focus on today. I will focus on the policy and practical part. Let me just say that I started from a very curious observation, which is that um, while in the West uh, we were discussing the so-called youth bulge in the southern and eastern Mediterranean, that was at the very same time that we had a discourse also on the issue of demographic aging, aging in our societies. So that was an interesting observation um, how these two discourses um, went alongside each other. Um, now, the youth bulge theory um, has something that emerged, is something that emerged in the 1990s and grew very much in the 2000s, where it became almost paradigmatic. And um, so the idea behind this is that an unproportionate large growth of youth um, causes high unemployment, which in turn makes societies vulnerable to, to social conflict. And um, while well, this theory um, is in a way a convenient theory to explain high unemployment uh, in, in the Mediterranean region, because um, in... <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, because in this way, um, we do not have to problematize, actually, um, the, the decades of failing economic policies in the region. And um, so it is, in many respects, a convenient explanation. And um, so actually, I would say that in the first panel, we spoke a lot about aid policies or trade policies. And I agree that trade is really important, more even than aid, because this is where economic power sits, I think. Um, but it has not been only that. Um, I think a big part is also the development model, uh, which we have promoted in these countries, uh, which has a big impact on the labor market in these countries. So this is what I will focus on today. Um, I will look at US and EU labor market policies in Tunisia and Morocco. I am focusing on labor market policies because, because EU and US youth policies have been labor market policies in these countries and vice versa. So labor market policies have been youth policies. Now, if we look at the European Union, what we see is that uh, while the 2005 action plans in Morocco and Tunisia didn't even speak about labor market or youth, we see that this has changed with the action plan in 2013, which speak extensively about youth and labor. Um, and what both the US and the EU identify, identify as key problems in the labor markets in Tunisia and Morocco are the skills education mismatch and problems with labor law and labor rigidity. 
And so they, uh, corresponding with this, they have pushed uh, both countries uh, for market-tailored education policies and for a more flexible labor market. Um, now, um, what we see in the EU, in, in the action plan specifically, is that the uh, flex security concept, which the EU has uh, developed as a, let's say, response to the, um, to the financial crisis in Europe in 2008, um, and which has not actually been implemented in all European states, um, it, has, it has transported this, this model into the action plans too. So flex security means on the one hand more flexibility in the labor market, so um, easier firings for example, and, but at the, at the same time more security, uh, so um, to increase the social security net. Uh, what we see in Europe is that we have more flexibility but less security today. So the concept has not been really implemented. Um, so, you see this in the action plan for Tunisia, which speaks about a better adaption of qualifications to labor market needs, the capacity building of public services in charge of employment, the development of labor legislation in the direction of a more flexible labor market, but the EU also mentions issues such as good labor and specific labor standards. Uh, this is missing totally in, in the US approach, actually, which focuses only on increased economic competition, through the privatization of significant, significant monop monopolies on achieving greater productivity and competitiveness as a means of stimulating growth and crea job creation and on demand-led education and training systems. So um, what we see is actually um, when, now I'm moving to the second part, which is the research that I have not been pursued, but I present to you what has been the, the outcome of research here is that um, these um, well, um, models of the US and the EU actually very much found their way into the national labor strategies in Morocco and Tunisia. Um, also here what we see that is youth policy is mainly a labor policy, and again labor policy mainly a youth policy, even though not all unemployed are youth, and not the main problem of youth is not only unemployment. Um, <clears throat> So uh, labor policies remain rooted in that kind of development model that um, has not really changed over the past decade. Um, and it has actually failed to produce sufficient and sustainable and, and decent employment. Um, so uh, self-employment and entrepreneurship has been at the core of national employment strategies in Morocco and Tunisia. Um, and both countries has also framed youth employment as an education uh, problem, whereby education does not match the needs of the market. And so education is, becomingly increasing, is becoming increasingly tailored to the needs of the market and not to the needs of youth, actually. Um, unemployment remains uh, relatively high, and um, the inclusion in the labor market, which these policies actually have produced, has frequently been subordinate and adverse, so that is informal and low-income labor, which is not covered by health insurance and so sustains inequalities. Um, Tunisia is uh, actually a good example to highlight this point. Youth employment remains high, um, the, which has been accompanied by the push of the vast reserve of unemployed youth into precarious and insecure employment conditions, um, and it has exacerbated inequalities, particularly, particularly between young people living in poor marginalized interior areas and those living in the big coastal cities. Um, now, the government in Tunisia answered this with a strong impetus for self-employment and the improvement of the employability of youth through training and professional internship programs. So these internship programs at times run for years. Um, which is a big problem in, in Tunisia. Um, so this has led to low-income jobs. Um, it, these jobs are not covered by health insurance. And um, much operates actually in the informal uh, economy, and so um, this has also failed to create a sustainable small business sector. And when I heard, for example, Franco Fatini speaking about microfinancing, that has been the US approach, but somehow this needs to be accompanied by a social security strategy for these people. You cannot only finance them. I mean, just to speak about the um, Tunisian um, street vendor who put himself on fire, that was self-entrepreneurship. And, and this is a problem. Um, now, migration obviously has played the role of a possible opt-out of this trap for young people. And MENA governments have promoted uh, migration on the one hand as a safety valve, and, um, uh, but which eases unemployment and sort of potential for social conflict. And on the other hand, we spoke about this already today as a development policy also, given that these people would send back uh, remittances. 
Um, so these policies have actually been pillars in dealing with the issue of youth unemployment on the one hand and development on the other, but uh, the issue of brain drain was inc increasingly addressed, for example, in Morocco through um, scholarships or investment opportunities. Um, now, obviously, today this option is becoming increasingly limited. Um, again, the EU, the, the type of mobility it is so far trying to, to foster is all... Um, high-skilled, educated labor. Um, that is evident, at least in the, in the mobility partnerships. Um, so, actually, countries like Tunisia, specifically after the uprisings, they tried to, to change this um, EU approach, and they spoke a lot about the issue of human rights in migration, the issue of, um, um, of brain drain, and so on. But in the end, they were not successful in, in influencing, I think, the EU approach uh, to the issue. And so in the end, it was Tunisia giving in to the EU approach. Now, what does this mean in terms of policy recommendations? I think um, it is clear that the current EU approach to the labor markets in the southern Mediterranean, and even more the one of the US, has been tailored to the needs of the market and not to the needs of youth. And um, this approach has clearly not led to less unemployment, and it has led to a lot of precarious employment. And so I think that the pressure of labor migrations of these countries towards the EU will remain. And given that this is such a strategic issue for the EU, it is about time that the EU becomes more reflexive about the kind of development model it is promoting. And the same goes to the US. And the EU is absolutely unreflexive about it, as we see in, in the action plans. So um, the neoliberal development model remains paradigmatic. And... Um, and this is something actually coming from Germany for me, something strange given that social democracy had such a weight in, in Europe and this simply um, is not there anymore. Um, so I am the, the, in terms of policy recommendations, um, so the EU should think about um, labor market policies which uh, guarantee a minimum wage, workers' rights, social security, and which fight labor market conditions that are conducive to informal labor. And furthermore, education policies should be tailored to diverse social groups and classes and not only to the needs of the market. And um, now then on migration policies, um, what is maybe important given that most of the migrants from the region are young, so actually the EU should have a more youth sensitive migration policy, which could be achieved by bringing youth organizations uh, into the process of thinking about, um, of, of setting the agenda in, in the migration policy. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Danielle. Uh, and certainly I'd recommend if people wanted to find out more about the project, the Med Reset project website is a very useful and valuable resource, as I'm just finding thank out. You, yes. <laughs> so now I invite uh, Paula Termine. Uh, Thank you. Uh, I'm uh, Paola Termine of, uh, of FAO. I'm very happy to be here uh, today um, and uh, to share some of the experiences uh, uh, that and the approach that uh, FAO, as the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, uh, is uh, uh, proposing to address some of the issues linked to uh, the root causes of migration and also um, uh, the uh, positive contribution of migration specifically to rural development. And um, so I will, uh, um, I will focus on uh, uh, some of the issues that uh, can be implemented that to uh, make uh, migration more a choice and not a necessity. Quindi looking more at, uh, uh, at what happens in the areas of origin, which for the majority are actually rural areas. So what I would like to really underline in, uh, in this contribution is to try and focus and, uh, uh, on what happens in rural areas where uh, the main economic activities is agriculture. Because unfortunately, in some of the policies, especially the ones addressing migration or labor markets, the dimension of agricultural employment uh, is uh, uh, not at the forefront. Uh, it's con mm, uh, sometimes it's ignored that there are very important sectoral differences if uh, uh, we look at industry or agriculture in terms of uh, what we can do uh, of policies. 
Um, so I think uh, previous intervention have already presented some of the data, uh, specifically looking uh, uh, at the Mediterranean uh, region uh, and uh, the countries of uh, uh, Middle East and North Africa. Uh, I'm working on a program that uh, uh, covers Tunisia and Ethiopia, uh, so uh, I'm based in the sub-regional office for North Africa WFAO, so I'm quite familiar with the dynamics of the North Africa. 40% uh, uh, as a youth unemployment rate is certainly a conservative estimate if you look at North African countries. Uh, another, I think, very important data to keep in mind is that participation of women in the labor force is uh, very limited in the labor market, uh, ranging uh, sometimes 50% to 25%. And this certainly uh, uh, is a dimension that uh, if uh, we take it into account into unemployment rates, uh, gives uh, a much more serious and uh, severe also picture of, uh, of the problem that youth face in, the, in these areas. Uh, and the Middle East and North Africa region have uh, about uh, uh, 20 million of migrants, so citizens living abroad, uh, and uh, for which actually the remittances, the flow of remittances for the countries is one of the main uh, sources of income. But one very important, uh, um, I think, uh, things uh, to underline is, for example, in Tunisia, only 3% of direct investment of uh, uh, the Tunisians uh, living abroad is invested in agriculture, which is one of the main economic activities of the country. So this really shows the imbalances and something that uh, uh, there is a, a bottleneck, something that impedes actually these funds and uh, uh, opportunities and possibility uh, to uh, develop rural areas which are the areas uh, uh, where uh, my, um, migration originates to actually um, invest and, and, uh, and develop and create, uh, and create also alternatives of employment. Um, um, agriculture and rural areas are not uh, often seen as attractive in terms of economic activities for rural youth, and this for very concrete reasons, because the jobs uh, uh, often are uh, seasonal, informal, precarious conditions, uh, very hazardous conditions, no access to social protection, uh, the productivity of labor is low, and therefore also the, the, the level of pay is, uh, is low. There is a mismatch of skills. There are some of the issues that have already been mentioned uh, in, in some of the previous uh, previous interventions. But one thing that is also uh, maybe um, uh, uh, less, uh, uh, less underlined is that uh, uh, youth also face very big obstacles and constraints in starting uh, activities in agriculture as entrepreneurs, so as self-employed. And uh, usually because these obstacles are uh, access to credit, access to land, access to information, and also access to markets. And this, uh, but also some of the administrative uh, red tape uh, in uh, starting uh, uh, on business activities, including uh, various types of authorization that could be from uh, the authorization to use uh, uh, water points uh, in the land. So something that can be very concrete, but that can actually really delay months or even years uh, the start startup of other agricultural activities. Uh, I think it's very important, therefore, to look at this link between migration and rural development, especially because migration can have uh, positive uh, but also negative con impact on the areas of origins. And uh, uh, often we look at the negative impact, like the brain drain, the fact that it's, uh, uh, the more qualified that it migrates elsewhere. Uh, but there are some uh, uh, potential impacts that are very important, and especially the possibility to invest uh, in a productive way remittances uh, from, uh, from migrants, uh, but also to sustain direct engagement and direct investment of diaspora uh, associations and groups, uh, individuals, uh, into, uh, into agriculture. But this needs uh, uh, services, uh, information, support, and incentive, uh, very concrete uh, in terms of policies. Um, I would like to uh, just uh, uh, draw some example from the program that uh, the FAO is implementing. It's uh, the name of the program. This is the first uh, uh, program of FAO addressing the root causes of migration and uh, specifically creating employment opportunities as an alternative to distress migration. It's implemented in Tunisia and Ethiopia and uh, is funded by the Italian Development Cooperation. 
the name of this project is Youth Mobility, Food Security and Rural Poverty Reduction, Fostering Rural Diversification Through Youth Employment and Better Labor Mobility. And uh, by the way, as part of this program, we also are doing a study on the determinants of rural migration uh, with MPC. So it is great <laughs> that uh, we can also uh, share some of the experiences from the other component of, of the program, uh, which uh, um, has the main objective of uh, creating policy co coherence between migration and rural development, and therefore to really integrate the issue of migration into sectoral areas uh, of agricultural strategy and rural development, including fisheries, for example, and at the same time maybe making uh, migration uh, policies and strategies, employment policies and strategies more sensitive to the, the rural dimension. And this we are doing in uh, uh, Tunisia and also Ethiopia. Uh, but I want to focus, uh, just to provide some concrete examples of one of the components of the project, which is uh, uh, providing, uh, uh, promoting innovative mechanism for the uh, creation of employment opportunities in areas that are characterized by very high level of uh, uh, out-migration. Uh, we identified that the main obstacles were uh, to find access to, uh, to credit, but especially uh, the uh, encouragement and uh, uh, the guidance, technical guidance on how to set up innovative activities. And we are not talking about micro-projects, because micro-projects often are not sustainable and uh, do not really access market. But agricultural projects that are innovative, uh, that uh, can also mobilize investments and credit, uh, even from uh, existing uh, commercial banks, uh, uh, institutions, and that have the, the potential to create uh, uh, also employment, uh, direct and indirect employment, uh, and also uh, inject, uh, 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 revitalize a bit the, the rural economy where, where they are. Uh, so what we did was to uh, develop a call for proposal for uh, um, yeah, for rural youth, uh, which uh, uh, aimed at uh, uh, identifying those youth that actually had uh, very high uh, technical skills, but they are still unemployed, uh, because there is a mismatch, especially for those who have a, um, a specialization in agricultural uh, technology, for example, and this is in rural Tunisia. Uh, very high level of education, and, uh, um, and also enhance the linkage uh, uh, and the contribution that uh, members of the families or friends or the community living, that uh, live abroad, so the diaspora, could actually contribute either financially or technically or through access to market to the implementation of this program. And this was actually the first time uh, was done uh, in, uh, in Tunisia, because as I mentioned earlier, there's a very low engagement, especially in the agricultural investment part. And um, what we found was that uh, uh, to uh, enable youth uh, that from nothing, uh, but, but uh, uh, some uh, limited startup uh, capital and, uh, and uh, technical skills wanted to uh, uh, start an agricultural program, uh, the process of uh, uh, coaching and, uh, and training is fundamental. We worked very closely with the Ministry of Agriculture and actually set up a system of what they call accompagnator agricole which is now becoming uh, an institutionalized profession and, uh, in the Ministry of Agriculture, to follow in a six-phase approach uh, all the process of uh, identification of a, a, an idea, uh, doing the business plan, accessing financing, uh, up to the post-creation phase, which is uh, commercialization. And uh, uh, what I can say is that uh, this is a process which is sustainable, actually creates employment also, not only for the youth uh, that are entrepreneurs, but also for uh, uh, the youth with uh, uh, maybe a lower level of skills that can be hired uh, as uh, either permanent or seasonal workers by these entrepreneurs, and also for a, a whole class of uh, uh, other youth that actually can work as a companionator agricole. And in this way, also provide encouragement uh, to the youth and uh, a new uh, image also of, uh, of uh, what, what can mean work in agriculture. You can have innovative activities, uh, even uh, using uh, uh, very, new, very new technology and, uh, and, uh, and also access, uh, access uh, new, new markets. Uh, so what uh, um, I just want to mention as a final uh, uh, recommendation that uh, uh, FAO is drawing from, from this project but also from other experiences uh, uh, that uh, uh, address the root causes of migration 
is that uh, um, it is very important to uh, identify what can be uh, the activities for potential of creating employment in a sustainable manner and uh, uh, unemployment that, that has to be also productive and decent, to be sustainable and to be attractive for the youth. And to do this, uh, it is needed to identify also the uh, very concrete obstacles that the youth may face and to address those. And also that there is a large room for work to further engage diaspora uh, institutions and to enhance the link with their communities of origin. And this can have uh, um, a very strong contribution, both in terms of financial investment, but also in terms of uh, uh, transfer of technical knowledge and identification of market opportunities. And, uh, and also, uh, there is a lot of work still to be done, and uh, there are a number of, uh, of examples uh, also uh, implemented by IFAD and other organizations in uh, enhancing the productive investment of remittances through programs of financial literacy, uh, through providing specific financial uh, uh, products uh, that uh, can uh, uh, enable uh, uh, migrants uh, uh, to send uh, uh, the funds uh, with limited costs and at the same time also orient or uh, even uh, uh, keep on owning some of the control of how the, these remittances are, are invested, which is, uh, has been found to be something that actually enhances uh, uh, the, uh, the amount of funds that is uh, sent back home. And uh, last but not least, we are promoting uh, uh, programs uh, uh, of exchange of information and experience between the countries in the same region, and specifically uh, through a program uh, uh, between Morocco and Tunisia. Because in the same region, uh, I think we should not uh, really forget uh, this uh, regional, uh, regional dimension. As it was mentioned at, at the beginning, uh, the majority of uh, migration actually uh, takes place within regions and not uh, between regions. And there are some uh, countries that actually are very advanced in terms of uh, uh, policy, for example, of engagement of the diaspora or uh, promoting uh, uh, the green economy, for example, Morocco. And uh, countries in similar situation uh, can uh, surely uh, learn and, uh, and adapt some of these uh, lessons. Thank you very much, and just to say, obviously we're very happy to be working with you on the project on the determinants of rural migration. On, on our fact sheet, which you've got there, all of our projects, including more information about this project on the determinants of rural migration. Uh, so if you are interested, there's more information on the website for that project and some of the other sources that were mentioned. I'd like to hand over to Anna Di Bartolomeo. So thank you, Andrew, for inviting me to this very interesting meeting. Um, I'm Anna Di Bartolomeo. I'm a demographer by background. And uh, as such, my intervention will uh, mainly focus on the link between uh, demography and migration, trying to give a, a broad picture on uh, why migration is today to be considered as a resource rather than a social cost for the EU. So I'm in the second part, in the second monologue in this sense. <laughs> and, uh, but I, I will try as much as, as possible to bring some uh, factual evidence on this, to bring some numbers and some uh, very general demographic trends on this. It is not part of any specific project, as the two previous uh, implementation, but is, uh, let's say, the, the results of years and years of uh, research done at the MPC, which is a, a core uh, advanced research uh, center in this, uh, in this specific topic. Uh, in particular, in my intervention, I will address two major points. First, I will discuss on how demography is shaping current and future migration flows at origin. Uh, with a specific focus in African countries by uh, detailing, by separating, by keeping always separate uh, what we call North Africa, MENA countries also with respect to the Easter part and uh, uh, Sub-Saharan uh, Africa. Uh, in this sense, I think indeed that a better understanding of the link between uh, dem demography and international migration at origin may better support a better management of migration policies at destination. In other terms, not all uh, 
uh, areas of immigration may contribute to the same extent uh, to the uh, current uh, demographic challenges uh, of the EU today. Second, I will try in this sense to bring some reflection on how demography is challenging instead destination societies, which has been already mentioned, and specifically the, the EU. Here I will also discuss the role of migration, again uh, trying to support a more positive approach to, to labor migration today. Uh, so let's start for the first point, uh, uh, how demography is affecting migration at origin. First, I think it's important to say and to know that demography is affecting migration from two points of view. The first is a qualitative point of view that refers to the profile of migrants who are migrating. And the second is the quantitative point of view, that is on the magnitude of flows we are receiving and we have to expect in the future. <laughs> Uh, depending on the different demographic stage uh, countries are experiencing, uh, one may be more relevant than the other uh, for uh, this uh, area we are interested in. Uh, what's happening today in Africa is that uh, demography is having a major qualitative impact in northern African countries, while it's having a major quantitative impact in sub-Saharan states. I will try to be uh, brief and uh, more clear on this. With respect to the uh, Northern African region, the major demographic pattern we are observing, which is linked to migration, is that we are assisting to the so-called birth of the individual in migration. And uh, I mean that we observe a clear difference between past and current and, uh, and, um, and the profiles of today. While in the past people migrated for, with the family left behind and remitting money because they have a family, they have a big family left behind, today it is not anymore like this. So it's also important to, I think, uh, uh, lower the emphasis on remittances, which is a, still a big source of, uh, um, of aid, of uh, uh, entry, of monetary entry in these countries, but it's uh, diminishing. Uh, and why is it diminished? Because of demography. Demographic trends, uh, uh, we see today the increase of three major demographic indicators in all of these countries. First, the age at marriage is increasing. Then the age at first child is increasing. And uh, as uh, derived from this, but it's a cause, it's a consequence of this, the proportion of never married is increasing. It means uh, that people who are migrating today are, less and le are more and more free from family burden at origin, both in terms of children and in terms of parents. Why they are, they are free also from parents? Because as was mentioned by my colleague before, we assisted to this yacht bulge. The yacht bulge means that people have many, 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 many siblings and uh, they have the possibility today to share the parents' burdens with, these, uh, with their siblings. So in this sense, uh, who migrates today is more and more uh, free. Is, uh, they migrate because, uh, not because they need to sustain economically their family, so remittances is not anymore a primary reason, but uh, they can remit less and use saved money for other activities. And this is very important to us, for us, because this means that they can invest the money they save in their, for example, human capital at destination. So they can invest at destination. That is something that was not happening at all before. Uh, so this means that, uh, uh, and this is just a, um, a point to be discussed perhaps, that if well supported and oriented these trends, uh, uh, are likely to have a very much positive effect for destination societies. Um, by so fostering the link between migration and development, that is the, the main, uh, the, the major top, one of the major topic in migration studies today and in the migration reality actually. Uh, so I think this is unique in the history and monitoring this kind of trends is uh, very important. Important to note, as I said, that this applies to Northern African countries, while this does not apply to Sub-Saharan Africa, which is as a completely different demographic situation and thus as a completely different migration situation, let's say. Uh, in this case, we have a quantitative effect. Um, demography, again, show that we have to be get prepared to migration. As was said uh, this morning by that Natalie Tocci, there's no doubt on this. African population is growing exponentially. We, we have that from one billion inhabitants today, we'll arrive to almost five billion by the end of the century. So it's something that numbers count in this, number matter in this sense. Uh, migration cannot be stopped, but only managed, better managed. 
unless uh, we are in the extraordinary, unlikely situation that uh, we will have an extraordinary economic boom in Africa, becoming the most brilliant emerging economies uh, worldwide, but uh, it's a very unlikely scenario, of course. In addition to demography, there are other factors are which are pushing for this, uh, um, for this uh, important, uh, immense uh, immigration that we have to expect. First, the rise of the level of education, because as you know, migration is a selective phenomenon, so the more you are educated, the more you tend to migrate, and this is also why I've been more more skeptical on uh, aid uh, uh, projects where there are no other uh, sustainable uh, uh, projects uh, accompanying with. Why? Because aid normally, if money, uh, as for example, I'm thinking about the new partnership framework developed recently by the UA, uh, if money is not enough, then the, the risk, let's say, that uh, you have people getting money, you have people investing money or education, and this is very good, but then the impact of migration is probably something which is counter-expected, because people get education and people want to move more. This is the, what, uh, it's not me when I'm saying this, but it is more or less what uh, uh, migration literature uh, uh, is for, has been focusing uh, a lot. Another reason is that uh, um, it's true that uh, there is this intra-African migration, but it's also true that this intra-African migration is, has been decreasing in the recent period. Why it has been decreasing? Because African is more and more, uh, is more and more inheriting uh, uh, the, let's say, Western um, model of nation states, uh, strengthening uh, borders, uh, strengthening securities, national identities. Uh, and this means that it's not so easy as it was in the past to move, uh, uh, to go, for example, to big uh, African country where there is employment, uh, and I'm referring of, uh, to Ivory Coast, to Nigeria, to Ghana, etc. It's not anymore the case. So people are somehow uh, blocked into the continent and will tend to emigrate more and more. To some migrants, migration will become more and more diverse in terms of profile and more and more uh, important in quantitative terms. But good to know, this is not a bad news, at least if we look at, again at facts and at demography. Mm, here I'm referring, I'll try to be brief, uh, to the link between demography and migration and destination society. Uh, by summarizing, there are at least uh, three ways in which demography is challenging uh, European social econ and economic goals. Uh, in demographic terms, the first is the total population of the EU is going to decrease or stabilize depending upon migration scenarios. Without migration, uh, the situation is, is going to be dramatic. This is what is said by any kind of projection you can find on the topic. And these are projections which are uh, realistic. Why are realistic? Because these are based on people who are already born. So it's not something that you are imagining, but it's something that you already know that is going to be like this. And uh, so the population is going to be um, uh, less and le is going to decrease. Is it a problem? Somehow, no, but somehow not, I, I would say, not directly for the well-being of citizens, but it can become a problem if you think to the relative weight that European Union can have in a global uh, governance, for example, in some institutions such as the International Monetary Fund uh, or uh, any kind of other international global governance institution. First. Second, the EU workforce is, is shrinking in both absolute and relative uh, terms. The former, the absolute shrinking, is uh, going to diminish the EU competitiveness in the world the relative shrinking of the EU workforce is going to seriously undermine the current welfare systems, and this is clear. Third, the labor force aging uh, will continue resulting in a strong project of aging of scale that is uh, translating to an increased prevalence of outdated knowledge among the workforce. There are, um, the workforce is made uh, for the uh, very important part of old people who simply do not uh, have the right skill for this uh, period. So this is another uh, challenge demography is posing to uh, the EU uh, countries to a different extent, uh, given the heterogeneity of EU member state. Not all of these states will be challenged at the same pace, etc. But uh, uh, it regards 
all European countries, European Union countries. So uh, without migration, these scenarios is going to worsen. With, with migration, the scenario is going to be better. Of course, migration is not the only solution, but it's part of it. Other solution, for example, uh, increasing uh, pronatalist policies uh, uh, are certainly effective. Uh, but probably m much more long-term uh, solution. Uh, adopting other increasing EU enlargements, it could be another uh, uh, solution, but of course this is made of political uh, issues, et cetera. Then it's another uh, problem. Um, Mm, so we need migrants. Uh, uh, migration is the most efficient and immediate way, uh, not, not the final solution, but it may help. Uh, and in this sense, Africa is the main potential source of migrants. This, this brings two other important questions, to which I'm not going to answer, but also research is working on this. Do we need all migrants? Uh, uh, do we need the temporary or permanent migration? Do we need uh, highly or low-skilled migrants? Because we, we frequently heard about the blue card is not working, in Italy is not working, while in Germany is working, but uh, from, from to, to such an extent, uh, you should keep in mind that uh, the, the labor market structure of Italy is very much different from the German one, so that Italy needs, actually, highly skilled migrants to a very much lower extent than Germany needs. So this is something we have to keep in mind. Um, and then, uh, do we need uh, uh, migrants? Which, which kind of skills? Uh, uh, in, in which kind of sectors, etc.? So, uh, research, I said, is uh, trying to answer this. Uh, there are some three, four priorities, uh, which are, however, still clear. Uh, first, that both temporary and permanent migration are needed because of demographic and social cohesion challenges. Second, that there is huge need of investing on a better knowledge and projection linking demography and labor market needs, highlighting how migration may contribute and in which way. Third, as soon as we know what is needed, we should also invest on better selection policies, which mean that uh, better selection policies, how to better select the profiles that we need in a cooperation with, of course, origin country. In general, uh, what I see as a major priority, again, but it has been already said, is changing perspective and uh, recognize uh, that migration is a resource and I hope uh, to uh, bring it today some uh, facts which may support this uh, uh, idea. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anna. I mean, that was a fantastic presentation of, a, of, the, of the key issues and a lot of the challenges.